uh, open. Uh, we'll be looking at it, and it would be a tremendous help to me if I knew you were able to follow through. We want to hear what uh, Jesus has to say this morning, and I'd love you to fasten on what he has to say. But as we do that, let's pray together and ask for his help uh, as we uh, listen to what he has to say. Our Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that we will hear him speaking to us this morning. We pray that he will walk off the pages we're looking at this morning and into our lives. Open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, our hearts to receive with faith that we might live trusting and obeying. For his name's sake, amen. Uh, apologies, we are going to look at a slightly wider section of Luke 13 this morning. It's entirely me. It's not down to anything here, but I just decided it'd be great to look at a bit more of Luke 13 this morning. So we've got a lot to do in the time, and I hope we'll uh, keep awake. Uh, Steve Jobs, the founder of the Apple Corporation, said, Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've encountered to help me make the big decisions in life. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've encountered to help me make the big decisions in life. And one of the things we've seen through this weekend looking at these chapters in Luke, and I'll just give you a little heads up if you haven't been able to be with us so far, one of the things we've discovered is that actually to be in church can be a very dangerous place to be. Spiritually, it can actually be the most dangerous place that we can ever be. It's possible to de neglect the most important decisions of life, even though we are sitting in church Sunday by Sunday and week by week. We can neglect to make that most important decision ever of whether we accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ. We can neglect those big decisions of how to make decisions about how to live in his kingdom and it can go undetected because we look safe and sound on the outside. We're sitting in the right seat on a Sunday. We're living lives in outward conformity that look religious, they look as though they're Christian, but on the inside they can be far from Christ and yet no one can know or realize what's going on on the inside. Church can be spiritually the most dangerous place to be. And Jesus has been alerting us very clearly and very sharply to that particular danger. Now, we've been asking the question because it's the question that comes up from time again and again in this section of Luke's biography of Jesus. The question we've been asking is, who will inherit eternal life? How can I inherit eternal life? We've seen that it's not just about starting in the Christian life, but about finishing in the Christian life. And I should have said when uh, Nick was quizzing me earlier that actually my discovery is in the Christian life, I thought as I got older it would get easier. And if you're younger here this morning, I'm sorry to disappoint you, it doesn't get easier. The challenges continue, they simply change, and sometimes they even grow. But it is still nonetheless the most wonderful life to live and I wouldn't swap it for anything it gets sweeter as the years go by not more bitter despite the challenges remaining but the Christian life is about finishing uh, many start the London Marathon but not everyone finishes it and that is true for those who set out in the Christian life not everyone finishes the big thing is do we finish well so the big danger Jesus has been warning against is hypocrisy. Looking religious, standing religious, uh, taking religion seriously. But it's an outward thing. And dare I say it, that being in a live church as this one uh, certainly is by all the signs I've seen, a church in which Jesus is present and Jesus is alive and people who know and love him, actually we can go undetected. We're not really in a living relationship with him. 
So the, this morning, the question that Jesus is posing to us is, will I, will you inherit eternal life? You see, that question came in, uh, in verse 22, uh, 23. Uh, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem towards certain death. Someone, verse 23, asked him, Lord, are any few people going to save? Who's in? Who's out? And we love to ask that sort of question, don't we? And Jesus actually turns it around and says, make sure you're in. So the question this morning is, will I inherit eternal life? And the question you need to be asking this morning is, will I, be in will I inherit eternal life? Not will they, but will I? And there can be big choices to be made. The choice to start living as a member of Jesus' kingdom under his rule, relationship with him, and to keep going. Those big decisions along the way in life which say, am I going to stay in Jesus' kingdom and live as though I am part of that? Or am I going to live as though I am just part of the world that's going on around me? And those cho choices are coming all the time, as we saw yesterday in areas of money, in areas of witness to Jesus, uh, the concerns of life, all those sort of things. Well, let's dig in a little to uh, Luke 13 and see what Jesus has to say. And uh, let's look back a little minute to verse 10 to verse uh, 17 and the promise of freedom that Jesus makes. I'm just going to read that little incident to you. It's a, it's a fascinating incident. It's a wonderful uh, incident too. Uh, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you're set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant! because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days to work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things that he was doing. Here Jesus gives a preview. A preview of what the kingdom will look like when it comes fully in the new creation. He is looking forward to that day, to his return. When this world is no more and he sets up a new world, a new heaven, a new earth in which there is no evil and in which we will know the full liberation from sin and sickness and indeed from Satan. It's a wonderful kingdom when we see the overthrow of all that is evil. What a prospect that is. When we're liberated from the destructive power of evil on our lives in all the ways that it grips them. Now, this uh, little section, this incident, raises the whole issue of suffering. Here is a woman who's been suffering for 18 long years. No medication, no pain relief, apart from the odd quack remedy, possibly, little herbal thing here or there but none of the powerful drugs that you and I know that can relieve our pain and suffering along the way. Now, this issue of suffering is an, an issue that keeps many from today, particularly, from putting their faith in Jesus Christ. It's an obstacle to believing. It's one of the things most people will say, well, what about all the suffering in the world? And the Bible never ducks the reality of human suffering. It never says, as some forms of religion do, that uh, suffering is all in the mind. No, it says that suffering is very much all in the body as well as the mind. And what is happening in the body affects the mind. And they're related. The Bible's very real about that. Never ducks that reality. Suffering is real. It is destructive. It is the sign of living in a world that is disordered, that is out of tune with its creator. Uh, suffering is a reality. And uh, the, the Bible, too, is, and Jesus is very real about the causes of suffering. 
that the cause of suffering is human rebellion. That because our relationship with our Creator is disordered, therefore the whole of creation is out of kilter. Now the Bible does not go on to say that all human suffering is related to all particular uh, human wrongdoing. That because I commit this particular sin, therefore I have this particular suffering. It doesn't make that link. There are obviously times when that is true. I do something very stupid, very evil, and it has a particular consequence. But by and large, that is not the case, and the Bible doesn't make that link. But it does make the link between universal human rebellion and universal human suffering. There is a cause, very real, about that. And then we hit the whole issue of Satan that Jesus raises. Jesus does love to raise these awkward things that we'd love to sort of duck if we could. It's a difficult subject to talk about today, isn't it? And indeed, um, the Church of England, you may know, has been trying to write out references to both sin and Satan in the baptism service. And it has recently been revised so that sin will uh, still make an appearance in the baptismal vows, but Satan is going to remain written out. It's very difficult to mention Satan today, but Jesus is very clear about it. And Jesus uh, assumes that there is a personal force of evil uh, who stands behind human affliction. Again, not a direct thing. But nonetheless, Jesus sees behind all human suffering the grip of one who holds the world in evil tyranny and from whom we need to be set free. And this uh, physical suffering of this woman is just a sign of a much greater tyranny that this evil force has upon us, personal force, Satan, in gripping us in the tyranny of our sins so that we cannot break free. It enslaves us. And this just isn't just pre-scientific talk. And it's a delusion, Jesus says, to think that we are free. Aging and suffering remind us that we are not free. We are not as we, we were created to be. We need to be set free. But set free not simply from our physical and mental sufferings, but from the spiritual disease that lies behind the spiritual disease of an evil heart that sets us against our Creator, that sets us, sets us against uh, one another and means we live in a disordered world, enslaved from the fear of death. Suffering, Satan, but all on the Sabbath, Jesus works. Did you notice that? The Sabbath which is a day of hope, a, a day of reminder about the completed work of creation that God had completed on the seventh day, but looks forward to the eternal Sabbath when everything will be reordered in the new creation. And Jesus seems to do so many of his great miracles on the Sabbath, not simply to provoke controversy, which he certainly does, not simply to make a point to uh, people like the synagogue ruler here, though he does, but actually to make an even greater point. And that greater point is that he is bringing in that eternal kingdom. This is the kingdom he wants us to share in. And we, we thought yesterday of the generous father who wants to give us the kingdom. And this is the kingdom he wants to give us. A kingdom where evil is overthrown and where we see the loving rule of the Lord Jesus Christ and there is human flourishing. And the Sabbath was meant to point forward to that. And therefore he is free to free this woman on that day from this tyranny. And it's such a contrast, isn't it, to human religion that binds and enslaves. Which is, oh no, you come back on Monday. We're closed, or closed today. God doesn't work today. Jesus says, oh God, is at work today to restore people, to free them today to proclaim the truth of Jesus that sets people free. It's a wonderful day that points forward to that eternity. Now it provokes as we see an indignant response from the synagogue ruler, absolutely sincere. I mean it's very easy to make a bogeyman of him, isn't it? 
uh, but actually, you see, he's standing by the letter of things. But Jesus says, look, you're prepared to treat your animals better than this woman. And there are people sometimes who treat their cats and dogs better than they treat others, aren't there? But here is a religious man, a pillar of the community, who is quite happy to untie, to set his animals free that they may take water, but is not willing for this woman to be set free from what binds her. It's a very clear point from Jesus. It's very challenging indeed, isn't it? But it's a glorious preview of the freedom that Jesus brings from everything that is evil. And there are three responses here. There is the response of the woman, verse 13. She straightens up. She praised God. She acknowledged who was behind her freedom. She knew that God was at work. There's the response of the synagogue ruler who is angry and indignant that such things could happen. And actually this is more often seen than we realize. So often the people who most oppose the spread of the gospel are people who would own the name Christian and are religious, but actually will hem the work of the gospel in, in some way or another. There's that response. And there's, there's a response of all the people who are delighted with the wonderful things he was doing. Oh, this is terrific, they say. But they don't say more than that. I think there's a contrast between the reaction of the woman who sees the work of God and others who simply see wonderful things. Yeah, it is a wonderful thing. But she attributes it to the one who has done it through his son, Jesus. I wonder what our response is to the prospect of the glorious freedom. Are we praising God for it? Thanking him for it? Or are we simply pleased with it. It's quite a challenge, I think, that Jesus poses us there. A wonderful, glorious promise of freedom, a preview of the kingdom to come. And then in the next little incident, we see the progress of the kingdom. Uh, Jesus asks the questions now, verses 18 to 21. Jesus asks, what's the kingdom of God like? I'll tell you what it's like. I'll oh, what shall I compare it? Oh, it's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Ask the question again. He really wants to nail this point home, doesn't he? What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the day. Well, you see, the glorious prospect of the kingdom to come, but what's it like now? Well, largely unseen, the seed grows in the ground until it comes up through, and a tree is very slow growing, isn't it? The yeast works in the bread unseen, but they are unstoppable. And I think Jesus is giving his followers a tremendous encouragement here. Yes, this may be a difficult world to live as a Christian. Uh, it may be hard sometimes to spot what is going on. What is God doing? We're asking that question. But why is it so hard? Why, why aren't people responding more? Why is there all this going on in our lives? Oh, yes, largely unseen, but it is unstoppable. Tremendous encouragement. And then lastly, verses 22 to 30, which we had read earlier, brings it down to a sharp point where Jesus teaches us about the priority of the kingdom. And he makes a very urgent appeal in verse 24. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door. He doesn't simply say try harder. He says make every effort. Stop at nothing to make sure that you enter into the kingdom. And he points out why that is the case and explains it. First of all, he says there's a narrow door, verse 24. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Oh, the claims of Jesus are very exclusive, aren't they? He says this is a narrow door. 
uh, not broad, but narrow. And uh, here again, here's that exclusive claim. Here's another thing about Christianity that so many stumble over and find difficult to accept. Yes, Jesus does say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and many are happy to agree with that statement. But fewer are happy, happy to agree with the second part of Jesus' statement, no one comes to the Father except by me. It's a very exclusive claim, and many find that very difficult to accept. And yet that is the claim that Jesus makes. And actually, let's just turn it round for a moment, because if it wasn't such an exclusive claim, we couldn't have certainty. It is because Jesus is able to make an exclusive claim that we can verify through his death and his resurrection, that we can have certainty about forgiveness and certainty about the kingdom that he's going to bring in and the certainty of knowing that we can have a place in that kingdom. And unless it is an exclusive claim, we cannot know that certainty. It'll always be in doubt. Is this the right way? Is that the right way? Oh, is there some other way? Does it matter? All sorts of questions start arising. So actually it's very important, and it is a tremendous thing that it is an exclusive claim. But it is a challenge to us, and we find it hard. And for many, it is a barrier. But there is a narrow door. There's also a final decision. Verse 25 once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us, but he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. There is a final decision. And if the exclusive claims of Jesus to be the only door and the only way into the kingdom is hard to take, surely this is even tougher. And we find this a great objection. But here are people, you see, who wanted to come on their own terms and not on Jesus' terms. There is a final decision that will be made and there'll be no change of mind at that point. Then's an urgency to this issue of who will be saved, who will inherit eternal life. Will you, will I, inherit eternal life? And the question is, am I trusting this today. Not did I trust it yesterday, not will I trust it in the future, but am I trusting it today? There's an urgency about it. And then, of course, there are two different destinies. Verses 28 to 30. Uh, there'll be weeping there and gnashing of teeth where you see, when, you, when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves thrown out. And, of course, these are people who thought they were in and he's saying you'll be out. But by contrast, verse 29, people will come from east and west and north and south. You see, this very exclusive route in is also very inclusive. Anyone may come from anywhere, from east and west and north and south, and they'll take their places at the, fe at the feast in the kingdom of God. Two very different destinies. There's a point in the Rocky Mountains where drops of rain that fall just millimeters apart fall into different rivers. And one travels uh, eastwards into the Atlantic Ocean. The other travels westward down into the Pacific. They start off millimeters apart, but they end up thousands of miles apart in different oceans, very different destinies. And you see, these people say, oh, we ate and drank with you, taught in your streets. We were there. We heard you speak, Jesus. We were there in church on Sunday morning at Christ Church Westbourne. We heard the same things, uh, millimeters apart, but end up in entirely different places, very different destinies. One in the kingdom, one outside the kingdom. Now, there's an urgency to this, and Jesus calls us to respond. He shows us a kingdom that is worth dying for, worth giving everything for. And the question is, will we? But more importantly, the wonderful thing is that Jesus has died himself in order that we may share in that kingdom. 
He has done what it is necessary to do that we may have a place in that kingdom. Because through his death, our sin can be forgiven. We heard about that earlier this morning. And just as we finish, we think about his passion. Just after this uh, teaching, people come to Jesus and they say, uh, Jesus, you need to disappear. Get off the scene because people want to kill you. Herod wants to kill you and you're going to die. And Jesus says, no, I've got to go to Jerusalem because I'm going to die. It's a very deliberate death he chose to die. And he knew that the only way that Satan's grip on this world and on our lives can be broken and be defeated is because through his death, through the payment for sin that grips our lives. Jesus died to set us free from sin's penalty and Satan's power. And it was a deliberate death. He died to give us the freedom. And there is, as we finish, his passionate desire for people to come into this kingdom. He teaches us with seriousness and urgency about these two different destinies. He does want to disturb us. He does want to frighten us a little. But he does so weeping over us. Verse 34, just glance down with me. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. That is the passionate desire of the Lord Jesus Christ for each one of us this morning who will hear him. He longs for us to come into his kingdom. He longs for us to make every effort to be in that kingdom, to give our all for it. When the big decisions of life come in, that we think with kingdom priorities and kingdom values, because he wants us in that kingdom. Steve Jobs said, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool to help me make the big choices in life. And Jesus says, look, there are different destinies. That helps you make the big choices in life. Maybe worth thinking about over coffee. Just asking, what are the particular issues that we face? Perhaps we're somebody who's been living the Christian life for many years, but there are still issues to face day by day, aren't there? Uh, how do I make kingdom choices to show that I'm in the kingdom? But it may be for somebody that today's the day to say, I'll enter that kingdom. I'll follow Jesus wherever he goes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you speak with seriousness and reality to us. Now, Father, it is easy to ignore the challenges of this teaching. Uh, yet they're very real. We want to thank you for the glorious preview we have of the kingdom that you're bringing in. And we pray that you would give us a longing to be in that kingdom as we listen to your son today. For Jesus' namesake.